<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Cody Krillman Calvet podcast. This is episode four. The ride continues, you guys. Man, we are back on the charts in Canada, at least. Well, we're doing okay in the U.S. And we're e- even getting some uh, some love worldwide. I got some screenshots from the U.K. today, and we are on the science and medicine category in the Apple ecosystem. And I think I'm sitting number five in medicine and science in Canada and number 80 on the overall top charts for all of Canada. Mind-blowing. Absolutely (laughs) mind-blowing, you guys. Okay, so this podcast is all about the future of agriculture. This is something that I'm really, really passionate about. And it's not so much even about agriculture like the conversation isn't really about agriculture the conversation is about technology and science in general so i'm a nerd i'm like a huge science nerd in high school i had a subscription to the magazine popular science and i was just like always fascinated with like the new stuff what what the future was gonna look like i grew up watching star trek and Yeah, super nerd. And then as I guess I went along in my career and started being involved in industry, I started thinking about disruption. I was, I'm obsessed with the concept of disruption in general. Uh, For example, for a very, very long time, I would go to bed with the singular thought of how or what would the disruption of the veterinary industry look like? And probably even more narcissistic than that, I would think to myself, and this is crazy, but I would think to myself, how would I disrupt the veterinary industry? And I was always fascinated by a talk. uh, This was a famous talk that Guy Kawasaki gave. I can't remember if it was a TED Talk. Let's just say it was. When he's talking about the disruption of the ice industry. So... I give this analogy often to students when they ride around in my truck. I almost give this exact dissertation verbatim to them just to get them started thinking a little bit outside of the box that, you know, the industry that we exist in now is not always going to exist in the future. So with the example that he uses is about ice. So how did we make ice in the past? You guys have watched the Disney movie Frozen. Uh, Well, yeah, I have. Anybody with kids certainly has. And at the beginning of the of the movie, you have a bunch of men down at a lake cutting ice, and that's how we used to get ice. They there was an entire industry, a very lucrative industry that revolved around cutting ice and shipping it off to all corners of, of the world to help with food preservation. And then technology came around and. They invented the ability to create ice in factories. And there would have been a a large subset of these lake icers that said, oh, nobody will ever, ever eat ice out of a factory or use ice out of the factory. My ice is the coldest. My ice is the freshest. My ice is the purest. And what happened to those guys? A couple of really smart ones decided to jump ship, sell their business while they still could and invest in you know whatever industry they wanted but maybe they were passionate about ice and invested in a factory and that was it and then some really smart inventor came around for like GE or Maytag or whoever it was that was like why are we making ice in factories when we can just invent the refrigerator why Would we not just create the product that people need and want from the the point source of where their consumption is in home? So they created the icebox, like the the refrigerator, the freezer, the ability for you to, to make ice. And the industry disrupted again. And there was probably a bunch of guys that were sitting around saying, you know, nobody is going to want to make ice at home. Electricity is expensive. They don't understand the costs. Imagine the safety issues. 
and then the industry was disrupted once again. Every industry in the entire history of the world gets disrupted by technology. There would have been a really nice caveman named Grog that had the best flint knives in the world. And he probably thought that there was no way that anybody was ever going to exceed his skill in knife making. And then somebody invented bronze or whatever the first metal was and made a steel knife or bronze knife or copper knife or whatever it was. It, it disrupted the industry altogether. And when we go to our kitchen to cut up a tomato, we certainly don't reach for one of Grog's sharp pieces of stone. We use technology. So I think about that in the veterinary industry. And this is, you know, part of that is what I'm doing here. That's what I'm doing with the vlog. That's what I'm doing to think outside of the box of what we're doing with veterinary, the veterinary industry, whether that's going to be telemedicine, remote uh, consultation. There's going to be a thousand different things that's going to disrupt our profession. Our profession is very young. It's uh, like 205 years old. But this is about agriculture, and this is like a really sensitive topic, uh, and it's also kind of depressing. It's not depressing for me, because I'm always thinking about it, but when I broach this conversation to veterinary students who are aspiring food animal veterinarians, and I talk to them about the disruption of agriculture because of technology, at the end of my dissertation, they seem very dis depressed and disheartened. And I always assure them that, you know, the disruption is probably not going to happen within their lifetime and they're going to have a long, fruitful career. But I just want them to start thinking about disruption and technology. So technology has always disrupted everything. Agriculture itself was a disruption in how we got our food. 10,000 years ago, somebody discovered the ability to, to harvest and seed. Maybe it was even longer than that. Harvest in a seed and plant it in the ground and collect those seeds and plant more in the ground. And, and that was the, the birth of agriculture. And animal agriculture followed suit because we had an abundance of, of carbohydrates and animals were coming you know, down from the hills t during drought times, uh, stealing from our from our food sources, and some of those animals got domesticated. Agriculture itself is a disruption. So in July, this July, July 20th and 21st, I will be heading to Boston for the New Harvest uh, 2018 conference. New Harvest is an organization that is, is looking at the cellular agriculture realm. So cellular agriculture is basically uh, the ability for us to create materials or foodstuffs uh, in not the traditional sense that we think of, of harvesting that directly from plants or directly from animals, but the creation of materials or food sources or other products from, from the cells themselves. So think of this as fake meat. Think of this as growing some sort of mushroom uh, tissue in a large vat that you would grow beer in or brew beer in and harvesting some sort of material that is analogous to leather. Like there's a thousand different possibilities when it comes to cellular agriculture. And I was asked to speak at their conference. Uh, the, they, they like my perspective in terms of, of I'm involved extremely heavily. My entire life is invested within animal agriculture, but I'm also, I guess, always thinking about technology and how it could potentially disrupt the industry. So I'm going to be speaking there July 20th and 21st. So if there's any Palpation Nation on the East Coast that wants to do a meetup, certainly send me a message. I would love to meet you guys on the East Coast. That would be my first time ever going down there. And the conference is at the MIT Media Lab. And I think the reason that I said yes to this conference was just to go to the MIT Media Lab. Uh, the MIT Media Lab, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing place where they're working on things like... The, they're basically inventing the future there. Uh, they are truly innovators in so many different fields in terms of, of social computing and robotics and material design. And that's where this conference is going to be held at this year. So I will be there. And I really just want to learn about the industry. I, I, 
have been thinking about selling your agriculture for quite a while, and I came across their YouTube channel when I was doing my search of, of cellular agriculture, fake meat, all those different types of terms that you guys may have heard about. And I watched every single uh, dissertation that they had at last year's conference, and I was very, very intrigued by the technology. Uh, when we're talking about meat, I'll just describe a little bit about like kind of where they've gone so far. Uh, we've been culturing tissues for, I, I don't know, like a decade or two decades uh, in terms of, of medicine. So the ability to grow tissues, uh, the ability to grow, uh, you know, very simple organs in a, a, a broth, uh, essentially. And there's been so many different startups that have started up that are working on this problem. How could you take cells from animals or plants and provide enough nutrients in an environment that allows them to grow? And there's so many different factors that go into that. Like, what is the correct bioreactor? What is the correct uh, scaffolding for these cells to grow on so we have, we have consistency in terms of texture? What type of, of broth mediums are, are we using? What are some sustainable broth medias that uh, will drive down the expense for us to potentially create these products? There's so many different aspects as to uh, and problems that need, need to be solved from that perspective. So the ability to create milk without cows, the ability to create eggs without chickens, the ability to create meat without cows or pigs or chickens. Uh, I'm not saying that cellular agriculture is going to be the thing that disrupts the animal agriculture, the agriculture industry. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but it certainly has a shot. When you look at the existing environment right now in terms of where protein companies are investing their dollars... They're not investing their money into places like feedlots. Cargill is the perfect example. So Cargill, this large family-owned, probably, I think it's probably one of the largest family-owned uh, industries or, or businesses in the entire world. They've divested out of the feedlot industry and reinvested a lot of their resources into alternative protein sources. And that could be a variety of different things. That could be uh, f fish farming, that could be insects. And it's also been some cellular agriculture startup companies. Uh, the most notable would be Memphis Meats. This is a, a company that was started by a cardiologist who was very used to growing heart cells in, in his practice for the treatment of various heart diseases. And he just got the idea of, well, if I can do this for hearts in people, why can't we do it for meat? And some pretty big names have invested money. Uh, you know, the guy who owns Virgin, like Virgin Records, uh, Sir Richard Branson, he's an investor. Bill Gates, ever heard of him? He's an investor in Memphis Meats. Cargill, investor in Memphis Meats. Tyson, the giant juggernaut Tyson. Uh, huge protein uh provider, maker, processor, they've invested in Memphis Meats. So when I'm watching this industry, and that's how I got, I guess, intrigued by it, when I'm watching these huge traditional protein uh, providers start investing their own money into these types of technologies, it really got me thinking of, is this, is this going to be the next disruption in agriculture, in how we feed ourselves? And like I said, I don't know if this technology is the thing that's going to do it. Um, it could be we could get an injection of chlorophyll into our veins and maybe become photosynthetic in the future. We could have uh, like Nalgene bottles filled with carbohydrates and proteins that replace a couple of our ribs that we fill up once a month, and that provides us with all the energy that we need. It could be it could be electricity. Like you just you don't know what it is, but it would be naive to think that the way that we get our food now in the future, whether that's ten years or ten thousand years, is going to be the exact same that it is now. 
even within agriculture, there's been immense disruption in terms of how we feed ourselves. I always love thinking about the feedlot industry. You know, we, we think about agriculture as being this, this ancient thing, right? This thing that has existed for 10,000 or 20,000 years. But when you think about the feedlot industry, it, it hasn't been around that long. The, the majority of feed yards did not exist pre-World War II. These were all developments uh, that, that popped up for a reason. And, and that's another thing that I love to think about is the why. Why do feedlots exist? Why do pig barns exist? Why do chicken barns exist? And I guess the best that I've been able to come up with was they exist out of necessity. If you think about the, the war era or pre-war era, you would have had a very agrarian type of population that were producing just a little bit extra food than, than they needed to sustain themselves. And they were able to sell that into markets. Uh, let's say you needed one cow to keep your family fed for the year and you produce two cows, you would take that cow to market and you would have a little bit of cash to buy some flour and to buy some sugar and coffee and whatever you needed for the year. But during the wars, we had this massive shift of agrarian populations to, to go overseas or to move into cities, to work into factories, to support wartime efforts. We needed to feed people. We needed to feed those people in the factories and in the cities, and we needed to feed those, those people overseas. And at the same time, there was this convergence of technology, of all of the things we were learning or had learned from the Industrial Revolution, uh, all these other new technologies that had also popped up at the same time. Antibiotics uh, were not really a thing in the pre-war era. And without antibiotics, we can't raise animals the way that we raise them in terms of, of large-scale animal agriculture. Even things like, like fertilizer and, and the ability to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and process it and create nitrogen that we can put down onto the land. Without the technology and the, the inventions that we've made during the war eras, uh, we wouldn't have the ability to get enough foodstuffs for those animals for them to be in in these these large scale operations we need that fertilizer we need those antibiotics uh, we need those those technologies for us to be able to do what we do and and I don't fault the industry at all we needed to do this it if I had as much as I love animals uh, if I had to choose between an animal's life, or a person's life, I would choose a person's life. Like, they're people. We have to choose people. And when it, it's the decision between whether or not somebody on the front lines is going to starve or somebody in the city that's going to starve, of course we're going to come up with creative ideas. And to, to and the best thing that we could think of was to turn agriculture into a, a factory, to turn agriculture into an industrial setting. And it is no fault of the industry at all. We've made incredible strides since then. Once, you know, once we didn't have to worry about feeding that many people, we've made incredible strides in animal health and welfare. Uh, but you can't just turn the system off overnight. And I'm not saying that the system even should be turned off overnight. We make continual improvements each and every day. I do as I, I do as a practicing veterinarian. My producers do as as farmers. The research community does as researchers. Every day we make things better. We improve that animal health and welfare and efficiencies and the, the taxes that we put on the land uh, for us to be able to feed what will soon be 9 billion people. We have to do what we're doing. But once again, I'm not so naive to think that that's going to go on forever, that there's not going to be some sort of technological disruption that will change everything. Of course it will. Uh, the, how we transport ourselves will be disrupted. How we clothe ourselves will be disrupted. Look at, look at taxis and Uber. The taxi industry was disrupted by Uber. The hotel industry was disrupted by Airbnb. It is just going to happen. And I want to, as a person who's within the agriculture industry, I want to see 
or at least be able to predict when that's going to happen. I'm a business person. I'm part of this. I'm investing massive amounts of my own resources into this industry. And if that industry is going to crumble one day, I want to be able to hedge my bets, right? Like it's, it's just, you have to be thinking about what is the next step and how can you still be a part of that? And when I think about, I guess, the the cellular agriculture aspect of that, so let's say that cellular agriculture is the technology that, that's going to win, at least for now, in terms of how we feed ourselves, that doesn't leave conventional agriculture out in the in the rain there's still going to be the need for the basic proteins and carbohydrates for these cells to to replicate to become produced Uh, from you know how they produce it right now it it's very expensive and it still involves animal agriculture. The main, I guess, magic ingredient when you're making meat in a culture is uh, fetal bovine serum, a uh, serum that is harvested from slaughter plants of pregnant cows. Uh, so, so you find a baby calf inside of a cow that has been slaughtered for meat and then you're able to extract its serum. And that serum is a very... Uh, coveted medium within the research community, within the medical community. It has all of these amazing growth factors, uh, basically a magical compound that lets cells grow, lets the animal cells grow. And we don't have a good replacement for that in, in cellular agriculture yet. There's tons of research that's going on to that. And I don't know what the next medium is going to be, but, but certainly that's what researchers are working on. What is the most sustainable? What is a cheaper way to do this? Uh, and agriculture is going to help provide that solution. We're going to have to create whatever that product is. Let's say it's, it's sawgrass. For, for whatever reason, they think that sawgrass is, is the thing. There's just going to be a shift of people who are cultivating alfalfa and barley and corn into a different product that's going to be used as a, as a culture medium. You can't create something out of nothing. Agriculture is still going to be an integral part of how we feed the world. It's just going to maybe take another route. I'm not sure, but it certainly seems like it makes sense to me. So I think that's one of the fears when I'm talking to my producers, and I talk to my producers about this. One of the fears of of my producers are, you know, what now? What am I going to do now? What am I going to do with all of this investment that I have in land and resources? And, And I don't think much is going to change in terms of people being... Uh, stewards of the land and creating a product that the the industry needs, whatever that industry is. It might not be the cattle feeding industry. It could be the, the bioreactor industry. So yeah, there's still always going to be a part. And it's not going to change overnight either. I think one of the major shifts, like first, let's say, let's play some thought exercises. So let's say there is, and there already are examples. Um, What's it called? There's a milk, there's a startup milk company called Perfect Day. So this is a milk, a cow milk that is created using cellular agriculture technology. Maybe I should back up a little bit. Cellular agriculture technology or cellular uh, technology is not new. We use this We've been using this to feed ourselves for a very long time. Think of yeast. Uh, how do you produce yeast that's in the little jar that's in the grocery store so you can make bread? It's made in a bioreactor in nearly the same sort of process that, that cultured meat would be made. How do you make uh, the enzyme renin that's used for cheese production? It's a, it's a bacteria that has genes from cows in it that produces the enzyme renin that's used in cheese production. We used to harvest that from calf stomachs because that uh, that enzyme in a calf stomach causes a clotting of the milk, and the clotting of the milk is in, 
is important for uh, the calf to digest all of the milk that it's drank. So it makes this big milk clot, and then the calf can slowly absorb all of the fat, carbohydrates, and protein. We've been creating those in bioreactors for years as well. Stuff like insulin outside of the food industry. Uh, insulin used to be harvested from pancreases of cows and pigs, and now we have the ability to using very similar techniques to what cellular agriculture is looking at in terms of these these bacteria or, or, or whatever it is. And, well, in the case of insulin, it is bacteria, genetically modified bacteria, to create insulin. So this technology is not new by, by any means. So we'll go through the thought exercise of what this potentially could look like. Um, you know, we have the perfect day example in terms of milk that I think it takes six proteins. So it takes six different milk proteins that exist and they produce those in these bioreactors and then they add water, like they isolate the proteins that are cow proteins that are naturally found in milk. And then they add water and they add some carbohydrates. I don't think in this one they add fat. I think it would be like analogous to a skim milk. They mix it all together and bottle it and you have milk, right? You, it, the, it's milk protein plus water plus sugar. That's all milk is. So what's that going to look like in terms of meat? So let's say you can create ground beef with the use of cellular agriculture. So at first, it's going to be more expensive than conventional agriculture, the more expensive than, than we can create beef using our conventional means, which is an amazing means of creating meat. Like a cow is a phenomenal piece of technology that we use to create a thousand pounds of meat using truly minimal resources or even resources from, from things that we couldn't I guess, utilize. So this concept of marginal lands that we can turn cows out into areas that are not good for cultivating corn, not good for cultivating barley, and they can go out there and harvest these these marginal materials and make a high-quality protein source. Cows are incredibly efficient. Uh, they're not going to be disrupted easily. But at first, there's going to be a niche market, certainly. Uh, people who, I guess, think that there's there's a welfare component to it, that they want to continue to eat meat, but they don't like the thought of the, the ethics that goes around the creation of meat in the conventional manner. But I don't think that's even going to be what the true disruptor is. There's there's always niche, right? We have uh, humanely raised meat. Uh, that that niche certainly exists, but niche doesn't disrupt an industry. Niche is always there. What what is truly going to happen with our ground beef example, if the the technology is able to do uh, things efficiently? is you're going to have a package of ground beef that's conventionally raised in Walmart for $2 a pound. Well, I don't think Walmart's going to exist then. I think it's going to be Amazon. We're just going to all buy our food at Amazon. I, I just want to buy my food at Amazon right now just because I like it. Okay. Except for I tried to order bananas on my Alexa today. She tried to order me cufflinks. I wasn't going to actually order bananas on Amazon. I just wanted to see what would happen. Anyways, I digress. So you type in beef, you type in ground beef in Amazon, and you see this conventionally raised product for, for $2. And you just see beef. And then you see below it a cellular agriculture pound of ground beef, and it's $3. You're not going to buy it. You're going to buy the $2 one. Regardless of what we say, and there's thousands of different surveys and research publications that prove this, regardless of the majority of people of, of what we say is important to us in terms of our selection of, of meat, that we like safe meat, that we like meat that's, uh, that's nutritious, even people that say that they want to have meat that is is uh, sourced from a humane and ethical source, when it comes down to that, they always, almost always, unless you're a rich person, they almost always vote 
with their wallet. And price is everything. So the cellular agriculture product, which let's just say for this thought exercise, is the same quality that it is completely um, non-discernible from the conventional product. And it's a dollar more. People are going to buy the conventional stuff. People are cheap. But the second that that product is $1.99 and the conventional product is $2 per pound, it's game over. Like, that, that's it. The, the cheaper product that is comparable will win regardless of the source. And a lot of the, I guess, clean meat... I, although I hate the term clean meat, it's very derogatory to all of the hard work that I put in every day. But this is how they're this is how they're positioning themselves. This is what Memphis Meats calls their potential product is clean meat. All of this cellular agriculture derived meat, uh, they're they're marketing themselves from from that perspective. They're marketing themselves as this niche product that is more humane than conventional, that is uh, not raised with antibiotics or hormones, although I think almost all meat that's been raised right now is uh, there's always, for the most part, from what I can understand, streptomycin, so an antibiotic added into the culture medium so other bacteria don't grow in it. So yeah, not antibiotic-free by any means, but it might be in the future. So they're playing off people's emotions. And I don't even know if they understand what the what the actual long game is, that if they want to disrupt the industry, it has to be cheaper than we can produce it in the industry that we're working in, in terms of conventional agriculture. And then the industry will shift. It just has to. The, you know, for for whatever it is, for better, for worse, that's how technology works. As soon as there's a, a cheaper option, it's game over. Now, what's going to happen to the cows? The cows aren't going to disappear over, overnight. And, and a lot of arguments that I hear from agriculture is, well, you can't just turn cows out and just leave them to their own devices. And that's not at all what would happen. This would be a slow progression for sure. And we would, I, I don't know why it sounds bad. As bad as it sounds, we would eat our way out of the problem. Uh, there's going to be cattle and feed. There's going to be lots of cow calf. There's going to be lots of mama cows that are out on the open range. And as prices dropping, those animals move out of the system in terms of, of being mama cows that are going to be eight or sorry, that are going to make babies. And they're going to be turned into cows that we're going to eat. We will literally eat our way out of the problem of having too many cows if that's what the market dictates. Cow-calf producers aren't getting as much for their calves anymore because people aren't buying conventional meat from retail. The packers aren't going to pay as much at the feedlot level because they're not making any margin. The feedlots aren't going to pay enough to the cow-calf guy because they're not making enough margin. And then the cow-calf guy uh, isn't going to be able to sustainably raise cattle anymore. So he's going to divest his herd. He's going to sell his herd. And when a producer sells his herd, they go into the feed yards and uh, he'll certainly take an economical hit. And then we have a significantly shrunk cow herd. Now, there's always going to be cows. There's always going to be a niche that also loves conventional agriculture and how we produce our, our animals. I always think about like the Hutterite colonies, right? So the these very traditional Anabaptist uh, Hutterite colonies similar to, to Mennonite or similar to the Amish, they're, they produce their own food for the most part. They are not going to embrace going into Walmart or Amazon. They're not going to go onto Amazon and raise or and buy beef. They're going to raise their own. But I have lots of hotter colonies that would have between 1,000 and 2,000 cows, and there's about 100 people on the colony. You don't need 2,000 cows to feed 100 people. So their herd will shrink sin significantly as well, but it's not going to go away. Just like we domesticated cows 12,000 years ago and hunting hasn't gone away. We still hunt. It's still a niche thing that people do. So there will always be cows. There will always be cow vets. There will always be ranchers. 
but from a, a from a business perspective there's a there's a real possibility that it's not going to be the same anymore and like i said i don't know when that time frame is i really don't but i have this gut feeling that it's within my lifetime and it's kind of a very strange feeling that i have but i kind of think i'm the last of the calvets like the last calvet right because to be a true Calvet and never to have any sort of, uh, you, you know, you're not augmenting your career with doing horse medicine or dog medicine or cat medicine, uh, it's going to be really, really difficult. And when I say the last Calvet, I mean like the, the last generation of Calvets. Because if there isn't a sustainable industry, then what is what is the need for us? And certainly there's also going to be disruption in medicine and, and there will be less and less need for somebody who can go out and administer um, a, a jug of calcium to a cow to get her to stand up for milk fever. There's, there's always going to be those adva- advancements. But part of the vlog, like when I create these videos, this digital storytelling, something that's always in the back of my mind is is how I look at the the James Harriet novels. So the James Harriet novels that I talked about in the previous episode, uh, written by this veterinarian. When I read his stories, I just fall in love with thinking about the nostalgia of what his life would have been like, uh, you know, 70 years ago. And how simple it would have been, not in a bad way, but but just how simple it would have been. And you're just traveling around from farm to farm. And I just envision like stone walls and, you know, these salt of the earth producers. It, it's not that much different from what I do, but it seems so far removed in, in how that, that generation would have approached things. And when I'm recording my day digitally in a video format... I kind of always think in the back of my mind that in 50 years, especially if some sort of technology disruption happens, that this is what the the future vet student, the the anybody who comes across my videos will think of like this documentation, like that was the last cow vet. And there will be even more a more extreme nostalgia. Imagine the veterinary student in a hundred years looking back at my videos thinking, Wow, look at all those cows. Farmers were calling Cody out to to cast broken legs and to do postmortems and and that industry's lost. And it is sad. Like I I I'm I'm absolutely heartbroken thinking about, you know, my my potential career being destroyed that that my son or my daughter who could potentially be a veterinarian in the future might not have the same options or opportunities or how different it could potentially look and when i look at my ranch families and these multi-generational ranch families it like it sucks but on the other side there's a there's a quote by uh, a businessman that I follow. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. And he says, the quickest way to go out of business is to be romantic about the way that you make your money. So from a a personal self-preservation perspective, that's what I think about as well. If if I'm going to be romantic in, in how I make my money and how I operate a business, that is a very quick way to go out of business. Just like the the ice cutter back in the day was romantic about how he made his money. Just like the the coach driver, the the four horse coach driver in New York City in, in 1913 would have thought of the automobile industry. Nobody's gonna ride one of those. They're loud and they're smelly and they're dangerous. They're I'm never gonna go out of business. I've been in business for 40 years with my four horse uh, coach business. And then 1915 rolls around and there's more automobiles in New York City than there is horses. Like, like, I think it was like 90% compared to 10%. It changes overnight and you have to be thinking about what that disruption would look like. 
But like I said, there's still going to always be the need for agriculture. So you guys may have seen this this sort of cellular agriculture thing popping up in the media. I've been watching it because I've been waiting for it to happen. And it's happened way quicker than I expected in terms of the media. And it hasn't been really mainstream media per se. But within the agriculture media, it has been spectacular to watch over the last year because this is on the radar of the of the of the agriculture interest groups, especially on the bovine side. And I don't follow the chicken stuff and the pork stuff uh, very closely, but I follow the cow uh, the cow media outlets like a hawk. And in every single publication that I come across now, there's always an article of talking about cellular agriculture. In somewhat of a derogatory way, you know, using the word fake meat. Uh, This is certainly an interesting thing to think about in terms of that term. Uh, Is it fake meat if it doesn't come from a cow, but it is structurally the exact same? That it's cow DNA and cow protein and, and cow collagen. And when you set them side by side, which you can't right now, but when you could potentially in the future set them side by side, they were virtually indistinguishable from each other. Is it fake meat? And like I said, with the term clean meat, the cellular agriculture industry is just as bad in terms of labeling, uh, labeling themselves as something that they're not. Uh, or maybe even if they are that it's it's a very inflammatory term that i think to to call it clean meat because then you're you're discrediting all of the hard work that i put in uh, in terms of making sure that that the animals that are entering the food chain are healthy that they are free of antibiotics that they are free of of added hormones like it you know we have meat withdrawal times for a reason and people don't understand that it is clean meat that we're putting into the system uh, maybe, you know, may, when they're talking about that, they're also talking about like bacterial contamination. And certainly that is an issue within our, the conventional means of slaughter. Uh, the, the contamination of E. coli in beef or salmonella in chicken or, and E. coli, uh, that has led to some serious health impacts and public health impacts when we're talking about that contamination. You know, if we follow proper meat hygiene and cook our meat, guess what's happened? Guess what happens to bacteria when you cook it? It dies. So as long as you're following good practices, you know, it's, it's not as much of a concern. But every year there are thousands and thousands of people that get sick and some people die because of contaminated meat. But it is everywhere within the industry right now of people talking and lobbying. So the lobby groups in Canada are lobbying in general in Canada is just not a thing. Like it's we certainly have lobbies, but it's not like the U.S. The lobbies in the U.S. are very powerful from my understanding in all aspects of, of any industry or, or vested interest group. But the cattle industry, especially in the U.S., has been lobbying very, very hard to get the definitions down straight uh, with the regulatory agencies for there to be this clear classification of what the word beef means, what the word meat means, what the word chicken means or poultry means. Uh, and a lot of that is piggybacking of on what the dairy industry had to go with. Uh, I think it, they've been fighting since the year 2000. The dairy industry has been lobbying to the regulatory agencies in the U.S. over the word milk. Uh, for them, and, and probably rightly so for them, the term milk should be reserved for uh, the mammary secretions that come out of an animal. But then we have all kinds of products out on the market like coconut milk and almond milk and rice milk and oat milk and a thousand different types of milks and they don't think that that's right that that should be called something different altogether so this is what the animal agriculture the the beef cattle industry is trying to get ahead of is is making sure that these these definitions are very clear before any of these products come to market and and the regulatory pathways for these products are already fairly well established or or more well established than you would expect but the product's not to market yet so it's certainly easier to change the definitions before you have a, a product out to market 
and I guess past cellular agriculture where we're talking about meat, uh, the lobbyists are also talking about things like plant-based proteins. So uh, Beyond Meats would be one. So a plant-based burger, the Beyond Burger. You'll see these at like places like White Castle now. Uh, I'm not sure if any Canadian chains are, are selling the Beyond Burger. But they want the definition of like, what does a burger mean to be clearly defined? Uh, when, when Beyond Meats, you know, that word meat is in there and there's no animal protein sources. It's 100% plant-based. So they're also trying to mitigate uh, consumer confusion when it comes to the plant-based proteins as well. And I, I do understand that, but it's also protectionist of the industry. And I, I appreciate when a interest group is trying to protect their industry. I truly do. But I also appreciate when you call it for what it is. This is a protectionist measure to ensure that their local industry is protected against disruptions and changes in technology. Um, I'm probably more sensitive to this as a Canadian um, cattle producer or Canadian cattle industry uh, person uh, because we saw these interest groups do this exact same thing with Canadian beef. Uh, we had this thing called country of origin labeling where lobby groups within the U.S. wanted to make it very clear on packaging so there wouldn't be consumer confusion of when they saw a steak in the store, in the supermarket, that they knew where that came from, that they didn't want consumers confused thinking that they were getting U.S.-based beef, U.S.-raised beef, and that they were getting, uh, you know, they knew when they were getting a Mexican steak. They knew when they were getting a Canadian steak. But it was protectionist of the industry. It, there, there's no safety implications. There's no issues with Canadian beef being in the, in the supermarket aisle. Besides, it does eat away at the market, right? This is why we have all of these things like tariffs in the, in the news. Be, because imported type uh imported type products disrupt the marketplace it it takes away from the domestic uh, value of the products that are created at home so i get the protectionist measures but on the same token we also don't want to create false labels Uh, if a product is virtually indistinguishable besides one came from a cow and one came from a bioreactor they probably should both be called meat, or at least that's just my opinion of it. Um, You can protect your industry all you like, but I think by putting more labels and more restrictions and more definitions as to what the word beef or poultry actually means, I think that is even more, uh, it's just not as productive because at the end of the day, all that we're trying to do is make sure that people have... uh, very healthy, nutritious, safe, sustainable products uh, so the human race can survive. And at the same time, we also want to do that in a very ethical and humane manner. So yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the gist of, of the story around cellular agriculture and kind of my thoughts around it. I certainly, I could talk for hours more about the nuances of each individual aspect and how I see this potential opportunity to exist. But it is very complex. And when I'm going to the conference, I'll certainly do a a post-conference recap and and kind of digest my thoughts and, and where I think things are going there's there's opportunity there and there's opportunity for everyone and that's the thing that i always think about technology in general is there's always going to be opportunity for the people that are thinking outside of the box for the for the ice cutters who thought let's try something different and see if it works so i don't know where that opportunity lies for myself i don't know where that opportunity lies for my producers uh 
but there's still going to be 9 billion people and then 10 billion people and 15 billion people that will need to be fed and agriculture is going to be a huge part of that. And the way that we get that those primary uh, components of protein, carbohydrates and fats into a human's diet is, is going to change. And we need to think about how each of us as an individual is going to be part of that story. If you guys have any comments or questions, certainly reach out to me on social media. Uh, my email is Cody at CodyKrillman.com. Reach out to me there. You can go to my Facebook page, Cody Krillman Calvet. Uh, leave a comment on YouTube. Wherever the social medias are, I am Instagram, Cody Krillman Calvet. Once again, thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, once again, I'm still just blown away by the level of response and all the amazing supportive messages that I've got over over the last week, uh, based off of this, uh, you know, this new endeavor. I love this medium. I love that I'm I'm wearing scrub pants right now. That's nice. Okay, guys, take care.